All right. Hey guys, uh, my name is Brandon Mintz. I'm going to be talking about the value of Bitcoin ATMs during Bitcoin's mainstream adoption. This is more of a beginner, intermediate level talk. I'm going to be going through kind of why Bitcoin became mainstream. I'm going to be going over the four main ways to get into Bitcoin. And I'm going to be talking a little bit about the Bitcoin ATM industry itself. So to give you guys some background on my company, Bitcoin Depot, I started it in June of 2016. For three years prior to that, I was doing some Bitcoin trading on peer-to-peer -peer websites. And I had a previous company called Cash to Crypto. And then I saw huge demand for Bitcoin ATMs and a physical presence to where people can go out and they can see something real and feel that, that trust factor and something similar to using cash ATMs their whole life. So since then, we've expanded nationwide. We have 100 plus locations in around 20 different cities. Uh, we have 50 of those machines here around town in Atlanta. You guys might have seen them in gas stations and convenience stores. So, in the past few months, my phone has just been blowing up like crazy. Friends, family, somebody's cousin's cousin, just everybody says, how do I get into Bitcoin? How do I get into crypto? I want to be rich. Let me, let me figure this out too. So some reasons why you know, Bitcoin has becoming so mainstream, and on the left here, you can see Drake looking at, at the price increase. <laughs> uh, in the early 2017, the price was $758. By the end of 2017, it's $19,343. Obviously, it's, it's dropped in. I know that. This is a little out of date. But that's a 25x increase. And you look at stocks, you look at bonds, you look at real estate. Never before has there been a gain of 25x in a year. That was pretty common. Um, on the top right, you can see the daily active wallets. These are wallets that have Bitcoin that are transacting. There was a day in January here, you can see on January 3rd, there's over a million wallets transacting. And on the bottom right, you can see Google searches for Bitcoin. These are people typing in Bitcoin, Bitcoin price, how do I buy anything like that? You can see a huge spike uh, towards the end of 2017. And if you look at the, the price chart, they're similar. So really what's going on here is more users, um, which translates to a higher price and word of mouth spreads. People have fear of missing out and they want to get involved. So here's some examples of Bitcoin in the media. On the top left, those are actually Katy Perry's fingernails. She posted a, a photo on Instagram uh, the other day and she painted her nails different altcoins. There's like Bitcoin gold in here, there's Litecoin, there's Ethereum, uh, there's Monero. And then another celebrity example is 50 Cent on the bottom left. He kind of forgot that in uh, 2014, somebody paid him 700 Bitcoin uh, for some work on an album. And then he just all of a sudden realized he has $8 million. So this kind of stuff is, is blowing up all over the media. And people are like, what is this Bitcoin if celebrities are doing it? It must be cool. You know, I want to get in. So on the, on the, the top right there, you can see some, some press articles. One notable one is about Overstock. Their CEO, Patrick Burns, is very, very bullish on Bitcoin. Because of that, their stock has, I think, experienced a uh, 3 to 4x increase in, in 2017. They're actually doing an ICO. For those of you that, that know about ICOs, initial coin offerings. On the, on the bottom right, you're going to see some names of big companies that accept Bitcoin. Subway, everybody's eaten there. Uh, Expedia, WordPress, you know, a very well-known blog type web development site. So of course, Bitcoin is out there. It's, it's becoming mainstream now. It's estimated 60% of the U.S. population has heard of it and about 1% of the U.S. population owns it. And as that number grows, more and more people want to get involved and they want to buy. 
So there's really four main methods uh, for people to buy Bitcoin. I personally used all of them many, many times over. The one I started with was peer-to-peer exchanges. I got into brokers, and then I got into Bitcoin ATMs later on. Here's a few of the big names uh, on the right side here. So the, the first one I want to talk about is local Bitcoin. So this is a website. It's peer-to-peer. It's almost like eBay. Anybody can go on and, and sell something. Anybody can go on and buy something. Um, it's, it's very, very quick compared to a lot of the other methods. You can sign up in the matter of minutes, but it's a really complex website. It may take you a little bit to figure out, but it's, it's pretty solid in, in that aspect that it's open to, to everybody and it's quick. On the downside though, because anyone can go sell on this website, anyone can go buy on this website, uh, it may not always be reliable. It's pretty easy to get scammed. You're not dealing with a trusted, vetted party. Local Bitcoins is not doing their due diligence on everybody that signs up. So it's really up to you. For example, let's say you bought Bitcoin at the beginning of 2017, you're up a lot and you want to sell it, you want to cash out some, you know, put a down payment on a house, who knows. So you go on, you go on local Bitcoins, you list your Bitcoin for sale for, and you want to accept PayPal, right? So let's say somebody sends you money through PayPal. You send them the Bitcoin. The trade is done, right? They go call up PayPal and they say, I didn't do that. And PayPal reverses the transaction on their end. And with centralized systems like PayPal, that can be done. With Bitcoin, it can't. So that person now has their money back and has the Bitcoin. I have personally dealt with thousands and thousands of people on local Bitcoins and done tens of thousands of trades. And I'll tell you, early on, that happened to me. I got scammed multiple different ways, lost a lot of money, but I learned from it. So it's not always the most reliable, um, but it it is easy to use for for a lot of people. Uh, And customer support isn't that great and isn't that responsive. You get scammed, you put in a request, could be three days before they respond and say, "You're, you're SOL, you know, sorry, you should have done your due diligence. Um, Another method are Bitcoin exchanges. One of the most popular ones is Coinbase, as I show here. How you should feel about Coinbase is shown on the right side of this screen. (laughs) Now, Coinbase, its benefit is is low fees. Um, It has some of the lowest fees around. It has a lot of users. It's one of the largest exchanges in the US. However, on the other hand, because it has so many users, and Bitcoin's demand is so high, it's experiencing more rapid growth than it can handle. Uh, To get signed up on Coinbase, you have to verify your identity, of course. And because you have to use a financial account, we're talking bank accounts, credit cards, debit cards, they have to do very rigorous verification. They wanna make sure you own that account. Everybody heard about the Expedia hack and all the hacks prior, and all of that financial account information is in the black market being bought and sold. And that's why Coinbase and these other exchanges have a very long verification process. Not only do they have to make sure you're who you say you are, but they have to make sure you own that financial account. So if you're very, very lucky on Coinbase, you may be able to get verified in a day, maybe two days. I personally have heard it taking two weeks, even up to a month, um, even with Someone who's completely legitimate, you know, no previous negative history, um, never got arrested, anything like that. So you never really know how long it's going to take. Usually when the Bitcoin price shoots up, there's more and more people registering. And it's very, very difficult for them to keep up with. Um, We did a, I'll answer questions at the end. We did a, a test a couple weeks ago, Bitcoin Depot customer support, Coinbase customer support. We tried calling Coinbase multiple times. What happened? We called them and they said, hey, this is Coinbase, due to long, or due to high volume, we no longer offer phone support, shoot us an email, right? (laughs) So it's kind of a marketing ploy that they're saying they offer phone support, but really it says, send us an email. Doesn't really make sense. Another method is the broker method. 
This logo right here is a logo for a company out of New York called Genesis Trading, which is a subsidiary of Second Market. Now, what they do is they connect buyers to sellers. Uh, it's pretty quick after you get verified, verification process can take maybe a few days, and the fees are pretty low. However, they don't want to deal with, with anybody who's a small fish buying even up to $75,000 one time. They only want to work with you if, if you're going to buy millions of dollars maybe over the course of a few months. If you have a, you know, a Bitcoin trading company or a company like me buying and selling Bitcoin constantly, it simply it's, it's not worth their time because the demand is so high. They're going to have institutional investors that are doing $10 million a trade and they may not even answer your phone call if you say you want to buy $100,000. I know it seems like $100,000 is a large amount, but it's not for them. <laughs> and typically, if, if you're new to the Bitcoin space, you, you're probably not going to buy 75 grand on your first go. You know, you're going to try maybe a few hundred bucks, see how it works out, play with it for a little bit, and then make a larger order the next time. Again, with this, you know, a bank account is required. They have to verify your financial information. The process can be long and, and very time consuming. Uh, the best method, my favorite, everybody's favorite in this room, I hope, <laughs> is Bitcoin ATMs. So the thing about Bitcoin ATMs, which really sets itself apart from these other methods, is because it is absolutely the fastest. It is the most convenient. If, if you live in a large urban city like Atlanta, uh, you're going to have, I think now there's 110 locations you can go to. So most likely you guys have already been in, in a convenience store or a liquor store or smoke shop that already has a Bitcoin ATM sitting there. Maybe you haven't even noticed, but it's typically going to be a five to 10 minute drive from you and you'll be in and out of the store in probably less than three to four minutes and, and have Bitcoin on the way to your wallet. With this, there is no bank account or financial account required. So what does that mean? Our verification process is going to be much, much easier. I don't have to say, do you own that bank account? Do you own that credit card? Or did you buy it off the black market? So we can just work with your driver's license. Um, another benefit to Bitcoin ATMs is you can use any wallet. So on the right, if you have an Android, make sure you download Bitcoin Depot wallet. It's going to show all of our locations, uh, and it also has some some cool functionality. You know, if you use Bitcoin uh, quite a bit and you're making purchases at restaurants or online, you can even categorize your expenses, and it's great when you're when you're doing your taxes. Uh, we actually answer the phone, so I don't have anybody in the Philippines, and I don't have anybody in India who answers the phone. It's actually real people in our office. And everybody likes to text these days. Nobody likes to call. You can even text us too. And we'll get back to you within a few minutes. And of course, we offer email support as well. So, you know, all in all, it's, it's the most convenient way to purchase Bitcoin flat out. Uh, but of course, I'm not going to be too biased here. I know I'm a little biased. So I'm going to say the cons. Now, the cons are the fees are going to be higher than most of the other methods. But again, you're paying for convenience. Why do we go to a convenience store and, and buy a drink that costs three times what it is at the grocery store? Why when we travel overseas, we go to the currency exchange and the airport and pay a 15 to 20% markup when we could ask our bank for euros? It's a similar concept here. Um, you know, and it's cash only. If, if you guys don't carry a lot of cash on you, you're going to have to go get some. But the majority of the time, we have a cash ATM side by side by, by the Bitcoin ATM. So it's pretty easy to get, you know, at least a few hundred dollars. Here's an analysis chart we made. One of the most important things that I want to point out is, is time, verification time. So as you can see here, our verification is, is instant. You may just have to scan the back of your ID. There's a scanner on the ATM. But Coinbase, you never really know. Like I said, you could get lucky. Maybe it takes a couple days. Maybe it takes a month. But fun fact for everybody in this room regarding why it's so important to be able to get verified and transact immediately. Bitcoin in 2017 has gone up on average 7% per day. So let's say it takes you two weeks with Coinbase, right? Two weeks to get verified. That's 14 days. 
So do the math, seven times 14. You potentially could be paying over 100% more for your Bitcoin. Now, if you can just buy the same day at an ATM, maybe you pay 15%. Maybe on a, a down day in the Bitcoin price, you're paying 20. But if you wanna go through all the struggle of getting verified on one of these Bitcoin exchanges and play a guessing game of how long it's gonna take, in reality, from what we've seen over the past four years, you're gonna end up paying more for that Bitcoin. It may seem like you're saving money in fees, but history proves itself that you're not. Um, so that's, that's the most important thing I think you should look at when comparing these different payment methods. Here's some fun facts about the Bitcoin ATM industry. There are 2,125 Bitcoin ATMs worldwide. The US is the most popular country for Bitcoin ATMs. Over 75% are here. We're putting out a few a day worldwide, not us, but everybody in the industry. Uh, there is a difference between some of these Bitcoin ATMs. Some of them are one way, meaning you can only buy Bitcoin. Some of them are two way, you can sell Bitcoin. The reason why the majority of them are one way right now are one, they're cheaper for us operators. And two, people recently just started cashing out a lot more. So a year ago, the price fluctuations weren't as crazy. You know, we were going from 600 to 700 a couple months later. But now that we've gone up, you know, 15, 20x in a year, more and more people are selling. And I think that number of uh, two-way machines is definitely going to increase. You know, hopefully in the long run, it's 100% of these locations. So this map really just shows you where they're spread out. As you can see, the US and Europe uh, have the highest concentration of these machines. They're called Bitcoin ATMs now, but the way the industry is moving, they really should be called crypto ATMs for cryptocurrency because many of these machines now are offering multiple different cryptos. Personally, with Bitcoin Depot, we offer Bitcoin and Litecoin, and we're actually gonna bring out Ethereum probably within the next few weeks. Uh, a couple other notable ones are, are Dash and Bitcoin Cash. One thing I really wanna stress that I've had a lot of experience with is security. So now that you've gotten your Bitcoin and you're holding it in a wallet somewhere, you wanna keep it secure. Uh, there's a lot of reasons why people want Bitcoin e ETFs to come out and a lot of reasons why people invest in the Bitcoin trusts that you can just throw money into, you know, on your IRA or E-Trade account. And one, that reason is they don't want to deal with security and figuring out how to buy it. Uh, as you see here on the bottom of the screen, 14% of all of the major cryptocurrencies have been lost due to hacks over the past few years. We're talking about Bitcoin, Litecoin, Ethereum, Bitcoin Cash. Every day, it seems like some wallet lost hundreds of millions of dollars. I know in the past week, I think it was called CoinCheck, lost a half a billion dollars. I think it was the largest hack of cryptocurrency in cryptocurrency history. So one of the things I wanna stress are, are things that I had to learn the hard way from the beginning. So I'm really saving you guys a lot of time here. Two-factor authentication. Does anybody here know what that is? Raise your hand. Okay, the majority of people do now. But when I got in, it was a new concept. Now, two-factor authentication is an extra passcode in addition to your password. A lot of people still want to use the word password as a password. And uh, <laughs> that's why I really want to stress this. And you never know, you know, you could write your, your password. Let's say you have an iPhone. You write it in the notes on your iCloud account. Your iCloud gets hacked. Somebody has your password. They get in. This prevents all of that. So one of the apps I would recommend is Google Authenticator. As shown on the screen, it's, it's the one on the top right, the blue and white one. It produces codes that are completely unique that change every 30 seconds. So even if somebody has your username and they have your password, they are not going to get into your account unless they have this code. And the only way to have this code is if they're looking at your screen. So it's very, very, very unlikely that you can get hacked this way. Um, another popular app for two-factor authentication is called Authy. Authy's all right, uh, but I personally do not use it. And the reason why is because in 2018, your phone number is your identity. 
I personally think that access to your phone number is more important than your social security number. Everybody's social security number in this room, probably 90% is online somewhere. You can buy it. People buy and sell social security numbers to open up fake financial accounts. It happens all the time. Uh, with your phone number, somebody can call up, let's say you have an account at AT&T. Somebody calls up AT&T and they're like, yeah, I'm this person, here's my last four of my social, here's my address. Okay, what would you like to do with your account today? Oh, I'm gonna actually move my phone number to T-Mobile. And so this hacker moves your phone number to their account and when they have access to your phone number, what do they get into now? Your phone number is your backup password for your bank account, for PayPal, for your Bitcoin wallet, and a million other things that have your money. So Authy is linked to your phone number, so what happens? Somebody gets access to your phone number, they get access to Authy, they get into everything. That's why I recommend using Google Authenticator. I personally, because people know I have Bitcoin, I have had my personal phone number ported twice in two years. Our business phone number got ported once. Um, we've had a lot, of, a lot of trouble protecting this because the phone carriers just let people access your account pretty easily. Um, luckily, the first time it happened, I didn't lose money with my personal phone number. The second time, I was a little bit unlucky. <laughs> and part of that was due to social engineering. So for all of you in this room, that currently use two-factor authentication, two takeaways I would give you are one, make sure it's Google Authenticator, and two, call up your phone carrier and add an additional PIN to your account. That way if somebody has the last four of your social, your name, your address, they stalk you on Facebook, they find your security answers, like what's your son's name, they still can't get through. Unless, of course, the AT&T person is lazy and doesn't ask for it, but maybe you can sue at that point. <laughs> Here's some other things to watch out for. You know, we've done thousands and thousands of trades with all types of people. We've seen all kinds of scammers out there. I've seen it all, personally. Um, one thing is watch out for fake websites, watch out for fake wallets, and watch out for fake exchanges. Do your due diligence. Google it. You'll probably find out pretty quickly. An example of an experience that, that I saw personally it, when I was trading on local Bitcoins, suddenly a, a local Bitcoins app popped up on the app store and everyone's like, wow, this is great. I don't have to go to the website anymore. I'm gonna download the app. They send their Bitcoin there and local Bitcoins comes out and they say, we didn't make an app. I don't know who that is. And people check their wallets. There's no Bitcoin there anymore. The hacker got it all. So definitely, Look through what you're putting your money into. Whenever I send Bitcoin anywhere, usually I'll just send a small amount, a few dollars, make sure the transaction goes through, make sure it doesn't suddenly disappear when it gets to the other side. Uh, another thing are Ponzi schemes. There's been quite a few with Bitcoin. You can see here on the, on the bottom of the screen, there's one called BitConnect. So BitConnect, they claim to have a trading bot that would make you on average 1% a day if you loan them money for a few months at a time. So, and your money would be locked up. You couldn't get it back. And they also said, if you have people under you that are doing this, you can make money off of them. So then you start thinking, hmm, this sounds like pyramid affiliate marketing, but it's making me money. I'll keep doing it. That was the mindset of a lot of people. And it went from like 14 cents, the value of the BCC token, that BitConnect had to, I think, $450 in a year. 14 cents to $450, that's absolutely insane, right? Way too good to be true. So what happened? BitConnect got cease and desist letters from a bunch of different um, state agencies, banking agencies, and they suddenly shut down. Everybody lost the majority of their money, the value of their token, went from $450 to I think $20 in a day. It was crazy. So if people start coming to you and they say, give me your money, I'm gonna lock it in for a certain period of time, bring in more people, you can make money off them too, just stay away. It's, it's not worth it. Even if you can double your money in a week, you may never see it again. So some money is better than nothing, right? Uh, check out this graphic on the right side of the screen. Uh, this is an example it, let's say you sell Bitcoin for a check or an ACH. There's a common misconception that people have. They think, 
if I get an ACH into my account, or if I get a check into my account and the money is available, it's cleared. I'll send them the Bitcoin. Or maybe they send them the Bitcoin before it's cleared. Either way, ACHs, believe it or not, are reversible up to 180 days later. You could sell Bitcoin, somebody could call their bank five months later and say, I didn't do that, and reverse it. Now you don't have Bitcoin, now you don't have cash. You got scammed. Same thing with a check. Checks can be available sometimes same day, up to a certain amount, depending on the bank, depending on your account history. Uh, but in reality, the check can take up to two weeks, even up to 30 days, I've read, for the bank's back office to review it to make sure it's valid. So same idea. You get a check from somebody, it clear, it, it's available in your account, you send them the Bitcoin two weeks later, I didn't write that check, they tell their bank, and you don't have Bitcoin, you don't have your cash, it's gone. Uh, another thing that is very, very popular amongst scammers in India and Nigeria that we've seen are underpriced online classifieds. People will call us up and they'll say, hey, is this Bitcoin Depot? And we're like, yeah. They say, I saw a uh, 2016 BMW convertible for $3,000 and they told me to buy Bitcoin. And we're like, are you serious? That's obviously way undervalued. And they say, well, it came from eBay, so it's legit, right? And we're like, no, 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 don't buy Bitcoin. And we warn them, and a lot of people say, they end up doing it, right? And they say, well, it came from eBay, but it was really a spoofed email. So they, they send the Bitcoin for this car, this BMW that's undervalued by what, like $30,000? And the guy says, oh, I'm in uh, the military in India. I'm gonna ship it to you. They never, they never get it, right? So if you see, a car, a truck, a boat, an RV, or anything that seems way, way cheaper than it is, don't do it. Even if the email says eBay, looks like eBay, or Amazon, or Craigslist, it's probably a spoofed email. We've, we've test, tested spoofing ourselves. It's very, very easy to do. It's a flaw in the email system that has never been fixed since email was created. Here are the wallets that I recommend. I've personally used all of them. Uh, I really like Airbits. It's what our wallet is based off of. Uh, I like BitGo as a web wallet. One of, the, one of the best reasons why I like BitGo is because it allows you to set the fee for your Bitcoin. For those of you that don't know, Bitcoin has had a scaling issue for many years. It's limited to seven transactions per second. There's more and more transactions that are being piled up and get backed up um, in the network, which is called the mempool. That causes transaction fees to go up because the way Bitcoin transactions are processed are if you pay more, the miners in the network are gonna be more incentivized to push your transaction through. So if you want your transaction to go to your buddy in Mexico in an hour, you may have to pay $50 to get your Bitcoin transaction sent. But with BitGo, they give you an option to set the fee at a lower priority. Let's say your buddy can wait a day, right? You can set the fee to be processed, or the Bitcoin to be processed in a certain amount of blocks. And instead of $50, you may be able to pay as low as four. And Jax and Coinomi are very popular altcoin wallets. Uh, it allows you to actually send Bitcoin to the wallet in exchange for altcoins right then and there. A lot of people think they have to use an exchange like Bittrex, Binance, and Poloniex to get altcoins. And right now, those three exchanges, they're so, so busy with all the new customers coming in that some of them are just like no new customers whatsoever. And you can't even get an account. And if you can, it, it could take a while to get verified once again. So definitely use these wallets to exchange for altcoins. Um, if anybody watches Game of Thrones, this will make sense to you. <laughs> Any questions? Nope. All right. Oh, in yep. general? Or yeah, just any questions on anything. Uh, or about the medium. <laughs> I don't know. But so anyways, uh, what is the uh, difference between like what do you guys do with the information when I, when I go to your machine and sell Bitcoin and I scan my ID? 
What do you guys do with that? It goes straight to Homeland Security. I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> we actually, so we're regulated as a money service business, just like Western Union and, and MoneyGram. Uh, so like them, you know, you have to give ID, your name, address, that sort of thing. It's simply just stored. And, you know, that way we can say if the, gov if the government ever comes knocking on our door, hey, are you collecting information from your customers and fulfilling those AML requirements that stands for anti-money laundering. That's all we're doing. So it, it's just stored on a secure server. It's not sent anywhere directly, unless you're some drug dealer and we find out. I don't know. You look like a normal guy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, because I, I stopped by one of your meetings on Memorial just to check it out. And so I was curious because I think it was, what, was there was there an ID scan? It was only when we got to three to $5,000, was that correct? So we do ID scans starting at $1,000, but there's certain triggers that under that it may ask you. Um, at $3,000, you take a photo ID, and that gets you up to $5,000 per day. Okay. <coughs> that answer your question? Depositor? Yeah. Over there. For, how does someone that's interested in getting started with AMDEX, how do they do that? And then how are the ATMs So to get started, there's a few things you need. And the hardest part is uh, compliance program. You need a full-time compliance officer. And that right there isn't cheap. Uh, depending on your business model, you could be required to get licenses on a state level. Um, so that's the hardest part, I would say. Of course, you need to find uh, potentially a bank that's willing to work with you. Every bank's going to say no when you come knocking on their door. Uh, you have to buy the Bitcoin ATM. Uh, the ma majority of the time, there are Bitcoin ATM manufacturers that have software already on it. The ones we use, we go through a software company who provides us the machines from a different manufacturer. Uh, the configurations are actually all set up on an online management platform. And you have to get set up with a wallet. There's just a few moving pieces. Um, but really, I would say it's not w as worth it as maybe three, four years ago, uh, just because of the, the startup expense these days and you really need economies of scale. You're going to be paying a $40 transaction fee to every customer who puts in 10 bucks. But that's my take on it. Um, yeah, right. Now. How many machines that you have in the store? Two questions. The first one is what's the benefit to the owner of the uh, store and the property that the machine is on? So it's a, similar, it's a similar model to cash ATMs where we own and operate the machine. So we'll put it in your store. We advertise the store online. More people are getting cash from the cash ATM. Revenues are increased that way. We're driving in foot traffic. The store is going to sell more. Basically, all we need is a two by two foot square foot space, and we pay the store a fee on every transaction. Um, do the store have to pay you a upfront fee to get the machine? There's no upfront fee for the store because we put up all the capital. There's no liability for the store as far as compliance goes, and there really isn't any liability for the machine itself. The uh, business people around me uh, collectively own about 14 um, stores. We have a Bitcoin machine in two of our service stations. We're looking at another one. So now, to put them in all 14, what level of communication do I need to get on with you guys? Uh, I would talk to the guy in front of you. <laughs> he... How do I get on that? No, no, seriously. So the guy in front of you, he's one of our salespeople, oh, and uh, about that? I'm completely serious. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna give this guy my name and see what happens. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we'd love we'd love to get more locations. Yeah. So yeah, I think there's a question in the back. Yeah, you all. So in the ATM network of your Bitcoin ATMs, they all share one wallet, or can your ATMs have individual wallets? They can have individual wallets. However, now you have to keep sufficient inventory levels, and for us, you know, it'd be 120 uh, wallets. So we do we do a master hot wallet, and of course, we have a cold wallet that's not connected to anything, and 
we constantly top off the hot wallet, just like pretty much all exchanges do. Yes? So her question was, what are the regulations on cryptocurrencies? Also, how many departments are involved? Um, it really depends on your business model. Uh, the main ones are FinCEN, which is the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network. They regulate what well, we are, money service businesses on a federal level. In addition to that, each state department has their own banking office. Every state's regulation varies from a state to state level. So you have to comply on the federal level and the state level. The IRS is the auditing agency for both of those parties. So if you're doing something wrong, they'll come in and they'll review you. And of course, you know, there's law enforcement as well you gotta listen to. Yeah. The ATM does not uh, validate you know, that that's your wallet. There's no way to access your wallet on the ATM. We don't touch any of, any of the funds you hold outside of the ATM. Does that answer your question? Right. So you can use any wallet. You can either type in your address, which I wouldn't do. You're going to be typing 35 characters. Um, the, the most popular way, a wallet will generate a QR code based on your address. So it's the process of buying. You're going to come in. You're going to verify your phone number. You may have to scan your ID if you're sketchy like this guy or if you're buying a lot. <laughs> and then it's, it's going to ask you to scan your wallet address. You insert cash and the Bitcoin will be sent to you and you either get a printed receipt or an emailed receipt. To sell Bitcoin, we're going to display our wallet's QR code on the screen. You would transfer Bitcoin or, or Litecoin there and then you would receive a redemption code you type in to collect your cash. Yes, in the very back left. So unlike a standard ATM, there's new regulations with taxes. Uh, with the exchange of cryptocurrencies. So how does that affect your ATM? I mean, we're gonna get like a 10 minute amount at the end of the year for withdrawing. So our customers would not get any 1099, you know, that's on the liability of the customer if they make any sort of capital gains to account for those and pay those. Um, for whatever reason, if you transacted a ton, you don't have your records, you know, we can provide that, but it's really on the obligation of the customer. Yes, in the, the back left, Brandon. Um, the redemption code, let's say like the memorable is like super cool and then you get a redemption code. Can you take that come back later and then can you take, or can you take that to other ATMs or redeem it there? So we actually have a uh, functionality that allows the cash to be dispensed immediately when you sell Bitcoin or Litecoin to our machines. However, you have to pay a high enough transaction fee. The only time where you're gonna get a redemption code is if you don't pay a high enough transaction fee. Right now, maybe the fee you would have to pay for us is, is it's pretty low, because we understand the issue with scaling. Maybe $5, something like that. But the redemption code, let's say, you didn't send a high enough minor fee for the Bitcoin to be processed into our wallet. That redemption code is only valid for that ATM. But let's say you're an hour away and you call us, we can transfer it to a different location nearby. Alex. Brandon, uh, really off this, uh, Sean's question, is there a difference in the, in the regulatory nature of uh, a Bitcoin cash conversion with a cash to another foreign currency conversion? Are you regulated differently? With different altcoins? No, no, different fiat currencies. Well, right now we only <laughs> accept USD. We don't allow forms of ID such as passports. We don't really have any foreign customers. Right now our machines can only accept USD, to be honest. I haven't really explored that because we haven't gone international yet, but you know, it, it's possible. It could have different regulations. But, but are the regulations from fiat crypto different than fiat fiat? It's still similar. And the most important thing that these, these agencies want to know is source of funds. Did you get that cash from a drug deal? Did you get that Bitcoin from a drug deal? 
So you have a source of funds issue on either side. Or did you buy Bitcoin from Coinbase? Can you prove that? Can you send us a screenshot? You know what I mean? So either way, cash in, cash out, there's still source of funds that you need to know where they came from beyond a, you know, a certain purchase limit. We're not gonna ask you that for putting in $20. But if you call us up and you're like, I have 100,000 I wanna sell right now, I'm gonna have to go to the ATM 20 days in a row, we're gonna be like, hmm, what's going on here? And we may have to ask you for further documentation on you know, where those funds came from. But further on that, on that note, what are some really creative schemes you see to help uh, understand what's going on? Creative schemes as far as... Converting, scheming, getting good... Trying to get beyond our limits? Yeah. <laughs> just, just Tell the secrets, bro. Tell us. Tell us. <laughs> so, I, I can't... I don't know, this room is full of sketchy people. But you're like trying to get the inside scoop. Um, so I, I obviously can't go through everything, but there are people have, that have tried to fake their identity and things of that nature. Yeah? Being cash only, what's the average transaction that The average transaction side on, on buys are typically less than a couple hundred dollars. Usually people sell more than they buy, and I think that's just because they've made enormous profits and they want to cash out. Yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> Maybe one more question or then we have to get Any, okay, one last question. You said uh, sort of trying to get around your limits. What, what are your, uh, your limits? So on, on the minimum, you can do $20 for buying, and the minimum for selling is 100. Keep in mind, you can do Bitcoin and Litecoin. For selling, you can you can do up to five thousand, and buying, you can do up to five thousand on the maximum side. And will it give you five thousand cash? It will spit out five thousand cash. Yeah. Twenties or hundreds? It spits out twenties. Yeah. All right. Thank you, everyone.